Hello, everyone. I'm Christy Risk, Senior Editor at Genome Web, and I'll be your moderator for today. The title of today's webinar is The Spatial Landscape of Gene Expression and Genome Integrity in Benign and Malignant Tissue, and our sponsor is 10x Genomics. Our panelists for today are Dr. Alistair Lamb, a Cancer researcher, uh, uh, a Cancer Research UK clinician scientist at the Newfield Department of Surgical Sciences in Oxford, and a surgical oncologist at Oxford University Hospitals NHS Foundation Trust, and Dr. Joachim Lundeberg, a professor in the Department of Gene Technology at the KTH Royal Institute of Technology, and one of the co-founders of the Science for Life Laboratory. You can type in a question at any time during the webinar. You can do this through the Q&A panel, which appears on the right side of the webinar screen. And if you look to the tray at the bottom of your window, you'll see a series of widgets to enhance your webinar experience. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Lamb. Please go ahead. Thanks very much for that kind introduction. So yes, my name is Alastair Lamb. I'm a, I'm a cancer biologist and I'm a prostate surgeon. That is. Uh, I investigate prostate cancer as a disease biologically, and I cut out prostates as an organ robotically. We're looking forward to sharing with you some work that we've been doing to unpack disease heterogeneity in cancer, using novel platforms to interrogate the spatial landscape of clonal biology. So we're going to start with a brief background to our labs really to give you a sense of what makes us tick. Before I move on, Chris, can I just check? You can see me, not Joachim. It looks to me like you can see Joachim rather than me. No, nope, you're on I'm video. Incorrect. You are. Fantastic. Yes. I'm sorry. Uh, OK, so let's let's move on. My, my lab, which I run under the oversight of professors Ian Mills and Freddie Hamdi, have been funded, as you heard, by a five-year clinician scientist fellowship from Cancer Research UK to deliver the SPACE study, Spatial Prostate Assessment and the Circulating Environment. Our context is high-risk localized prostate cancer, which we interrogate using a number of techniques, biopsy, surgical removal, image-guided sampling indeed, and blood sampling. And our goal is to identify the, the lethal clone, the component of localized disease, which leaves the prostate, metastatic disease being the strongest determinant of lethality. Well, there are three components of what we do. And the first is MRI guided biopsy of the prostate to enable integrated genomic analysis at the first sampling point in prostate cancer. Second, we seek to unpack clonal heterogeneity across the whole prostate. And third, we want to identify from lymph nodes and other circulating sources the small numbers of cancer cells which have left the primary lesion, so-called micrometastatic disease, to enable us to identify this lethal red clone here at the bottom right. And then, full circle, identify back at the beginning where that clone exists in the first sampling point of prostate cancer. But the work we're presenting today really sits uh, center in this diagram, the, the stage two, if you like, um, tracking the spatial context of this lethal clone in the whole organ, the whole prostate. And we're going to present to you the background to this work and how we've gone about trying to identify this lethal clone. So I'm going to hand over now to, to Joachim. Thanks, Alastair. And just a, a very short background to my laboratory. I'm a technologist by training, and we have been working for many years how to find ways to study gene expression in tissue sections. And we stem from this technology background and having the possibility to monitor thousands of genes from thousands of positions within a tissue kind of requires that you also have the tools to analyze that. And we're build, building up several tools for study uh, that type of data. And that has also led to that we actually have a, a computational biology group that makes completely new ways of looking at data. And I'll give a snapshot of that as well. And finally, the fourth pillar of my group is working in biology. And like in this example, we would like to demonstrate some of the work 
mixing these technologies in the case of prostate cancer. So before uh, then continuing, I just want to say a few words about spatially resolved transcriptomics, as that is the driving technology within this presentation. So spatially resolved uh, transcriptomics, in a way, started already in the 80s when you designed a probe to query your favorite transcript within a tissue. That probe was labeled with a fluorescence or isotope, and you could see where in the tissue context your favorite transcript was uh, placed. This type of technology has actually over the years evolved, including more and more probes to query more and more genes. And it's a constant development of that type of technology. In the late 90s, uh, laser capture macular dissection came around the corner where you actually use laser to isolate regions within the tissue, and then you did a type of mini bulk analysis of that sample. Again, this type of, of technology has also been expanding over the years. In early 2010s, you had the first demonstration that you could actually do sequencing over transcript in a tissue context, and that was by Mats Nilsson at the Silaf lab, uh, as well as myself. Um, and then, actually then, this has also been increasing its modalities and, and increasing its capacity to monitor more and more genes. But actually in 2016, we developed spatial transcriptomics, which at that, that time was the first method that actually captured the entire transcriptome using the poly-A tail of the mRNA. And by there, we, by that, we actually capturing uh, all the population of transcripts and not only the ones that we have designed probes for. And indeed, this kind of technology to look at the entire transcriptome has evolved with many more and recent uh, technologies in this field. And indeed, some of these has also been commercial, like, like the 10 Exhibition platform. So the work that we started out in 2016 was really then to deconvolute gene expression in tissues. And we brought out tissue samples, which we were then sectioning uh, and putting a cryo section on top of this glass surface. So first of all, we stained that and we imaged that. And then we permeabilized the tissue and let the mRNA migrate down to a barcoded surface. And by cDNA synthesis, we could then harvest that and put that onto a sequencer. And by that, we could actually deconvolute which gene we have, but also its spatial position within the tissue. And since we captured the uh, mRNA at the poly-A tail, we could do very unbiased data-driven analysis. So we let gene expression tell us what is in this tissue section. And in this presentation, we'll start off with the mRNA, but we will also continue into the uh, spatial DNA analysis work. So early on then, when we developed the technology, we were, we were using uh, our own barcoded arrays. And the spots at that time was 100 micron. And 10x has now this uh, commercial platform, which is 55 micron in size per spot. So this spot then contains the poly T probe to capture the mRNA, but it also contains a barcode sequence for that individual spot. This also means that we are capturing a, a group of cells and not a, always a single cell. However, over the years, we've tried to improve this technology. And one example was providing a high resolution ST analysis using two micron beads, demonstrating that we could actually increase the resolution in this type of workflow. Recently, we also demonstrated that you could do also analysis on formula fix samples that we believe is, is super fantastic if you think about the uh, archival samples that are stored in, in our ar archives. And finally, we also have a paper in BioArchive demonstrating that we could also do in isoform or translocation analysis by doing Oxford nanopore sequencing on the material that is provided from these barcoded arrays, retaining that spatial information. So we were super happy earlier this year when uh, Nature Methods uh, announced that the method of the year is spatially resolved transcriptomics. And what you actually see on this image is, is the barcoded surface on, on the lower part. And on top of that is small intestine, which has then been stained by an H&E. And on top of that, you have these data-driven patterns that I mentioned, letting the gene expression actually tell us what we see in the histology. And many times, the granularity of gene expression is, uh, is much higher than the morphology in itself. And I'll try to demonstrate that. 
So we also have a team, a fantastic team that works on the computational and the mathematics side. And what they really are using from this type of data is obviously the image, but also the count matrix. And the count matrix is very similar to a single cell analysis workflow. But instead of a cell, you have a spot, and then you collect the information from the abundances of each and every transcript within that spot. So over the years, we had developed uh, viewers, uh, and we also provided our packages that you put on uh, Surat to explore data for this spatial analysis. And then we also developed finer tuned uh, elements in the analysis to identify spatially, uh, ident well, spatial uh, transcripts that is based on uh, some type of entropy analysis. Furthermore, we have put a lot of effort into probabilist modeling, and, and we're looking at this gene expression space, and we use this modeling approach to factorize uh, all the gene counts that we obtain from the data. This really allows us then to, to create factors for different gene signatures, and these factors or clusters all have a spatial barcode, so you could actually put them on top of the on the tissue. We also develop tools which actually take advantage of the single cell data in terms of cell types, and we could actually then provide probabilistic ways uh, how which cell type is present in each and every spot on the barcode. But one of the most exciting uh, developments recent is, is in deep learning, where we not only take advantage of the gene expression space, but we also take advantage of the image and put that into a neural network. And we have uh, this tool that we call Excuse, uh, which is really corresponding to a super resolution ST analysis. So as I mentioned earlier, we are, we are meshing gene expression within the spot. But with Xfuse, we could actually infer which genes are present outside the spots and actually also between images. And I'll just have one quick snapshot how, how exciting it is to look at this data. So what you see here is, again, small intestine. And you could appreciate that it's a H and E image of the small intestine. And on top of that, you have the barcoded spots. And in this case, we're just visualizing one single gene. And, and you could actually see that in orange. But on top of that, you have this super resolution resolved spatial data. And you could appreciate how fine, detailed information we get of gene expression at this. And I think this is something that we will see much more of in the time to come. So in this uh, uh, presentation, we will then focus on how we use these tools in prostate cancer. And it really started out in, in uh, some years ago when we studied prostate cancer and published this in Nature Communication. So I think the word is over to you now. Thanks, Joachim. <clears throat> so um, uh, Joachim has kindly segued us back to prostate cancer, and I'm um, unashamedly going to uh, emphasize why this is important. So prostate cancers extremely common. Um, as you can see here, it's the second highest in terms of the share of the world population with cancer. Um, to put it another way, I, I sometimes say to fellow guests, perhaps senior guests at a dinner party, when they ask me how likely they are to get prostate cancer, um, I, I tell them that if they are the owner of a Y chromosome, then they have a roughly 50-50 chance of getting prostate cancer if they live to the age of 80. How likely are they, though, to know about it? Well, that's about 10%. And how likely are they to die from it? About 3%. So it's very common. But in those statistics also lies a big problem, which is that the vast majority of men with prostate cancer will not even know about it, let alone die from it. Although, of course, 3% of all men is still a lot of men. And this is another way of, of outlining the problem. There's a big range of survival rates for those diagnosed with prostate cancer. As you can see, if you look down this chart, it can be as lethal on the left-hand end of the prostate cancer line. Uh, it can be as lethal as bladder, kidney cancer, and indeed lymphoma. Or at the right hand, and it can be one of the best cancers to have in terms of survival. 
We tend to risk stratify prostate cancer using a combination of three things. A non-invasive biomarker, PSA, prostate-specific antigen, which we get from a blood test. TNM, tumor node metastasis staging, from examination of the patient and imaging. And then histological grading on the right from prostate biopsy, the so-called Gleason score, which is still probably the most or one of the most accurate predictors of outcome. But there are big inconsistencies here with lots of crossover between groups. Some men who we expect to do well, doing poorly, and of course, vice versa. Uh, well, why is this? It, it's partly because prostate cancer is a really heterogeneous disease. This paper from the group in Cambridge where I did my PhD um, showed using bulk sequencing and fluorescence in situ hybridization analyses uh, that one prostate shown here on the top right had three areas of cancer, the colors, uh, with distinct but related phylogenetic profiles. Of course, the problem with bulk sequencing is that it loses all the resolution from within these large uh, tissue cores, the, the, the little discs, the circles on the um, cork board on the bottom left. These singly sampled areas mask further extensive heterogeneity within. So to summarize so far, uh, our objective, if you like, using all the sampling methods available to us, is to unpack the spatial heterogeneity in intraprostatic disease on the left in order to identify the origin of lethal extraprostatic disease on the right. And we aim to do this by discreetly identifying lethal subclones responsible for treatment resistance and ultimately death from prostate cancer. Just as an interlude very briefly here, there's been much to be sad about in the COVID pandemic, but I suspect many of us are aware of certain silver linings. And for my part, I can certainly say that this project is one such silver lining. If you'd allow me to indulge for a moment, Joachim. In, in 2019, Joachim kindly hosted a new postdoc of mine, Andrew Erickson, uh, who performed much of the analyses we're presenting here at SciLife Lab for a few weeks to learn spatial transcriptomics. We could see the potential of the, the, this platform to interrogate clonal dynamics in this multifocal disease, prostate cancer. And we had some ideas about some single cell RNA-seq approaches that we thought we could use in this context. But I really felt we needed to zoom out to look at the whole prostate. And I was in the process of selecting some perfect candidates from my operating lists when COVID hit. And uh, well, Oxford took quite a draconian approach and closed down all patient recruitment to trials or research that weren't directly affecting clinical care. In fact, that's not quite fair. This is Oxford, remember. And um, well, you know which basket Oxford placed all its eggs in. Um, to put it this way, if you weren't working with AstraZeneca, then your research stopped. So it was such a relief when Jurkin reached out to us saying that they had some whole prostates from some colleagues, some uh, urological colleagues in Stockholm, and they'd already done some busy MST and had a manuscript in preparation. And they asked, could we help with some additional computational elements? It was perfect timing and really well, well Joachim and, and, and I and our, our teams have spent the best part of a year in weekly Zoom meetings doing just that. So uh, back to you, Joachim. Okay, thank you. So, so I just want to recap some of the things that you actually said. Um, we have a challenge then with this multiclonal prostate tumor and, and our options if we would like to do molecular analysis, obviously bulk RNA sequencing and that really masks the heterogeneity of, of the tumor. Or you could actually go into single cell RNA sequencing. And indeed, then you have a, a tool to understand that uh, the heterogeneity, but you're kind of lacking the, the spatial information. So I actually see that the single cell work and the spatial transcriptomics work goes hand in hand. So in one case, you obtain cell type information, and the other uh, type you get regional information. So you could identify regions of stroma, immune cells, and cancer regions. 
So what we did this in this pilot study uh, published some years ago was really to team up with the pathologists that in their H and E stain look for where where do we have tumor cells. We use our probabilistic modeling that generates a, a, a lot of different factors corresponding to different features in the sample. And in this case, we found a factor that overlaps with the cancer. And indeed, we could confirm that with immunohistochemistry. This actually led us then to, to think about, could we do some type of uh, tumor atlasing? And indeed, we could have then find unbiased factors uh, corresponding to different uh, tissue components. So this is a factor overlay, uh, overlapping with benign glands, some with stroma, some with cancer, some with a, a proposed precursor to cancer, and some inflammation markers. But indeed, we, we could also obtain a much higher granularity than the histology by itself. And this is just one demonstration of that. On the left here, we have the prostate tumor uh, annotated by, by the pathologist. But with our data-driven approach, we could actually identify three different factors for the same histological region. And you could actually see where, where these factors or gene sequence signatures appear. And they are separate, mostly separate entities, indicating that we have a lot of things just happening within a, a one uh, appearing a uh, one single tumor clone. So in, in the ongoing work at uh, Salaf Lab and now also at Oxford, we realized that this spatial technology is a great tool to look at the spatial components, but also if you put that into a temporal, you really could make very nice progress to understand uh, biology. And we've done this kind of concept for organ development, uh, uh, within a human cell atlas perspective. We've done this for never generative disease, uh, see how disease progress. Uh, and then we also have to heterogeneity, which we will focus in this presentation a little bit more. So we have a number of subclones, and they usually have some relationship, and you could actually put them into a cl clone tree, which each subclone then could be a proxy over time. The, tr uh, the traditional way of doing this is really then to really to do LCM. You look and you look for these tumors and you do a LCM of this region and you do a low pass whole genome sequencing or exome sequencing to deduce that. But what we have tried to do is not to, is not to go the genome way directly, but rather use the transcriptome to infer copy number changes within the genome. And it has some major advan uh, the, uh, the advantages that I will uh, outlay, lay out. So what we really would like to explore is, is we're capturing the complete transcriptome, and that actually represents the complete genome. Uh, and the, this basic idea was actually already uh, identified in single cell world, where you could actually infer these copy number variations at the genome scale uh, in single cells. But what we have done in our work then is, is really to put a spatial label onto these inferred copy number variations. So we did take, as uh, Alastair mentioned, an organ-wide perspective, and I'll mention why in a second. But what we really do here is take a cross-section of the entire uh, prostate and cut those into small cubes. And each cube then is sectioned, and then the sections are put on these spatially barcoded probes. You take an image of that. And that is then the starting point for the pathologist. And in this case, we use uh, several pathologists to find a consensus view of what uh, is in each and every spot. And then we perform our spatial transitomics analysis using Visium. And from that uh, expression profile, we could then infer copy number variations. So in the end of the, this experiment, what you really obtain, this is a small part of the barcoded array, is that in each and every spot, we capture the complete transcriptome and infer the complete genome. And we do find patterns within uh, the tissues that we're investigating. So the thing that we really embarked on early on was, is there a possibility to link benign regions to the tumors that we observe uh, by histology? And could we actually be able to identify some type of clone tree? Could we find uh, relationships between benign areas to actually the tumor in the end? And this study that, that uh, we have been put on by archive 
it actually is a fantastic demonstration where we could search for more than 150,000 spatial measurements and look for Copen aberrations. And then you could compare that to the LCM kind of strategies that usually ends up in, in about 10 mini bulk analysis. So uh, this is the, really the reason for, for taking the organ wide is, is to just to, to describe the landscape of, of this. So we work with the pathologist that helps us then to annotate this. And this is just an overview. And in blue here, you see the benign regions. You have the pin, the pre-stage kind of thing. Uh, you have a transition state over here. And then you have the different grades of gleason that Alistair mentioned. And they are pronounced in two areas, here and here. But we also have a low grade, a gleason grade down here. So this is the ground truth from the pathologist's point of view. Then we run our transectomics analysis. And we generate these factors. And the factors then is represented here by individual colors. Um, and these colors then mostly then corresponds, as I mentioned previously, to benign gland, to stroma, to pin, to immune, to cancer. And as we see here, this is the area where you have tumors. And indeed, you could see some unique patterns, colors, representing probably cancer clones. What is extremely exciting is that we take the same data and then infer the copy number variations. And what we've seen here is like in a yellow scale where we have the hotspots for copy number variations. And in a way anticipated, we, we find a lot of changes where we have tumor, but indeed we see some also modifications in other areas. And that's something that we explored in the next uh, slide that we explored further on. So Alastair. It's you, Alistair. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, so as Joachim says, let's dive into some, some, some data. Well, in this figure on the left, we have an infer CNV plot where each row represents one of the approximately 10,000 spots taken from all of the cancer-bearing regions of this prostate. And these have been ordered by unsupervised hierarchical clustering into putative clones, which we are able to determine, um, uh, using which we're able to determine an organ-wide phylogenetic tree, which we show on the right. Dotted lines represent those relationships about which we are slightly less confident, usually due to sort of spatial distance across the prostate, uh, but also potentially due to heterogeneity. Solid lines are those about which we are more confident. Um, usually, again, those that are in spatially proximate regions of the prostate, but also where we see more homogeneity within clones. Well, across the inferred genome, we can see clear signal indicating certain homogeneous features. For example, that big blue arrow in the middle there indicating chromosome 16p loss but also quite marked heterogeneity. For example, those regions defined by a gain in chromosome 4P or in chromosome 8 in general, which is a known site of important oncogenic drivers in prostate cancer, such as CMIC. So we've used this approach um, to demonstrate areas of similarity and difference between organ-wide tumor foci, the heterogeneity that we are so keen to unpack. But having identified areas of similarity and difference between organ-wide tumor with foci, we also then wanted to look in greater detail within those foci to see whether we could locate the particular clones. And we see here by juxtaposing both histology and clones, so the top row here is histology, with red demonstrating cancer, high-grade cancer, and orange slightly lower-grade cancer, and then on the bottom row, the clones, hopefully you'll agree it's evident that the what look to be uniform cancer areas actually disdain, contain rather distinct clonal areas. Again, we believe clear evidence of intratumoral heterogeneity. Having identified this in areas of known tumor, we then wanted to take a step back and look at the organ as a whole, including all benign areas. Here we see all 
25,000 approximately uh, spots across the whole prostate. It's worth remembering in that uh, Nature Genetics paper that I shared, there we were looking at just five sampled areas compared to the 25,000 here. Uh, oh, we've moved on. There we go. Well, what we found, interestingly, was that amongst these benign spots, while the majority are copy neutral, a small number, as highlighted by the blue arrow, do display clear copy number alteration. And so while we selected what we call a, a sort of true benign region, that's the box, those spots which we believe are both benign histologically, but also don't display any copy number uh, alterations. We then wanted to interrogate one section, which we believe includes histologically both benign and tumor, to interrogate this further. And um, so we, we see here this next slide. We're focusing on uh, just one section over on that left-hand side of the prostate. I'll show you a map of the prostate again in a moment. And this is looking at the approximately 1,500, 2,000 whole genome copy number profiles of each spot on this section. So again, we see heterogeneity across the rows of spots. But I want you to focus here in on the homogeneity within one set of rows, the yellow putative clone C corresponding to the yellow clone on the phylogenetic tree. Well, let's move to the section itself. and see where these clones sit. Well, if we look at the left square, we see the histology with blue representing benign prostate glands. So these are glands that have been checked and double checked by two independent pathologists. And these pathologists have looked at every single spot and excluded any spots with less than 50% coverage of a particular phenotype. So we're doing spot level consensus pathology here. Blue areas are benign and red areas are cancer. Well, in the middle set square, we see the, the clones. And these are the clones, remember, that have been fingerprinted effectively by their inferred copy number profiles in the previous slide. Pleasingly, the clones do localize in proximate locations, indicating what we believe to be truly clonal origins for these spots and probably relate to the branching morphogenesis in development of prostate, prostate glands. Well, strikingly, we see that the yellow clone that I asked you to take note of a moment ago actually represents an entirely benign region. So I say it again, this is a region where two pathologists, Richard Colling in Oxford, Thomas Murphy in Finland, have carefully inspected every spot and confirmed that this does represent an area of benign histology. So to our knowledge, this is the first time that it's been possible to show that the majority of mutational events present in prostate cancer were actually already present in the benign ancestors to those clones. And we think this has huge implications for diagnosis and indeed for clinical management of this disease. In recognition of any doubters who might not trust our inferred copy number approach, we also took some fluorescence in situ hybridization to validate certain key targets. We chose here CMYK on chromosome 8, I just mentioned that, and also P10 on chromosome 10. And on the right here, we were able to validate that yes, these changes which are not present in true benign disease were indeed already present in the yellow benign clones, as well as in histologically proven prostate cancer. In case you think we are only interested in, in prostates, or perhaps have missold you on the title of this, of this session, we did also look at certain other tissues, two of which are shown here. On the left, we have a lymph node and uh, if we look at the bottom, we can see at least at a gene expression and histological level, this lymph node, as we all know, is 
markedly heterogeneous in terms of the structures present. However, in terms of its inferred copy number profile, the, plus, the, the green um, band A, if you like, at the top of that left-hand side, we do not see any copy number events across this histologically heterogeneous but benign lymph node. On the right, we have another cancer, squamous cell carcinoma in the skin. And here we have validated our finding, which we noted in the previous slide in prostate cancer. Again, if you look at the yellow uh, clone B and just below that clone C, there are certain copy number events present in these histologically benign areas of squamous cell, of, of, of squamous epithelium, which are also present in the histologically proven squamous cell carcinoma. So finally, we move on to another cancer. This is pediatric uh, brain cancer, uh, medulloblastoma, because we wanted to know if this was something that we observed in all cancers. We do know there are certain cancers which display a more monoclonal appearance. And by contrast to the squamous cell carcinoma that I've shown you in the previous slide, and, uh, and, and of course the prostate cancer, we see here a uniformly, uh, uniformly homogeneous copy number uh, profile, inferred copy number profile across this area of cancer. And being homogeneous, we were also able to validate this by bulk sequenced analysis. And we demonstrate there two of the key copy number, inferred copy number events, um, which we have managed to validate uh, at a DNA level uh, using bulk sequencing. So I'm going to hand back to Joachim for a summary and roundup. Thank you, uh, Lester. Uh, so just as a summary of, of this presentation, I think we have proven that spatial contact really matters, especially then in, in the tumor context. Uh, and we hope we convince you that data-driven approaches is a remarkable way to annotate tissues, both at the RNA level and at the genome level. But I think this study also put forward the importance of a multimodal approach for studying these, that you consider their morphology, you will consider the transcriptome, and you consider the genome. And combined, it gives you very rich data sets to look at. And finally, in our showcase, we, we hope that we have shown ways in which we could infer CMV uh, between and delineate how benign to tumor states can coexist within a small tissue samples, but also at the organ-wide um, scale. And then we kind of, I hope that we have uh, opened the Pandora's box as a way now to study somatic mutations in benign tissue. And we believe that this is the new frontier for early detection of tumors. And with that, I just would like to thank the funders for, for developing technology and also applying this to cancer. But most importantly, I would like to thank the group at Salaf Lab that has contributed to this whole organ prostate work, which is Reza, Emily, Kim, Maya, Linda, Alma, Michelle, a super group of uh, scientists in my lab. And Alistair, it's thanks, and I'd also, thank you. Yes, and I'd of course uh, like to thank my team as well, um, and and you, you Joachim, and your team as well, of course. Um, but uh, you know, my, my senior colleagues, Ian Mills and Freddie Hamdi, have been a, a great support in this work and continue to be in future plans. Uh, but my postdoc uh, scientists, particularly Andrew Erickson, who's done a lot of the computational work in this project. Um, uh, we have a number of clinical fellows working with us. Exciting to see them uh, building ideas for future projects. Uh, we're also very dependent on our pathology team. I've mentioned the two pathologists that we've worked with, uh, but also our pathology technicians. And of course, we couldn't recruit patients to these studies without our excellent research nurse team. And of course, I'm also very grateful to our funders. Great. Uh, thank you both. Um, as a reminder to webinar participants, if you have a question, please type it into the Q&A box in the control panel. Before we begin the Q&A, we'd like to ask attendees to take a moment after the webinar has ended to give us feedback by taking our exit survey. All right, let's launch into our questions. Uh, so our first question is uh, for both of you. Um, 
what is the minimum spatial resolution that you think would be needed in order to change treatment recommendations? Um, Alistair, would you like to take that one first? Gosh, I thought that question was going somewhere else, and then the final part talks about treatment <laughs> recommendations. Um, so we haven't talked about, uh, can I answer the resolution question first? I think that refers to the size of spots, um, but perhaps the questioner could add a follow-up if that's possible, if I've misunderstood. Um, the, the, the spots have obviously been getting smaller and smaller. We believe, don't we, Joachim, that uh, the, 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 the most recent generation of platform that we're working with at least in prostate uh, epithelial corresponds to maybe about 10 cells. So it's not quite single cell, but it's getting down towards that resolution. And certainly we believe sufficient for us to interrogate these uh, clonal branching phylogenies. But the second part of the question was uh, a big jump on uh, to influence clinical management. Um, I think there are a few steps that we need to go through. And I hinted at these, didn't I, in my... Um, outline the context, if you like, that I gave early on for the, the work that we're doing as a whole, particularly in terms of being able to uh, confidently uh, de demonstrate lethality. And so we need to be able to show that these clones are the, the lethal clones, and we'll do that by linking what we've discovered here to a, a micrometastatic disease and indeed where, where relevant um, proven metastatic disease. Um, I think if we can do that, then as I mentioned early on, we then come full circle. And if we identify this clone with sufficient granular resolution, as the question suggested, at the first sampling point in, in this cancer biopsy, then we can influence clinical management by saying this man is that subset, that 3% who may go on to die from his prostate cancer, rather than the other 47% who won't. Joachim, would you like to add anything? No, I think uh, um, Alistair covered it. W what we could say about the resolution on, on the barcode array, um, I think there's a push in general to, to increase the resolution. And I believe Tanex is, is talking about the uh, Visium um, HD, high density. And I think uh, that and others will allow us to actually increase the resolution with, with the barcoding strategies. Joachim, when do you think the uh, technology will will uh, progress to be able to uh, to get to single cell resolution on spatial transcriptomics? And do you think that that will be uh, a, a significant breakthrough? That, that's a very good question. And it's a little bit hard to answer because it kind of depends on which question you're asking uh, uh, in your experiment. So definitely in certain perspectives, uh, a single cell resolution will be uh, important or, or vital even. In other applications, you may not need that. Um, and actually, I, I think we are at a point of developing high-resolution barcoded arrays. And there are also some very nice work uh, by uh, Dr. Fang at, at Yale. We actually you already now provided single cell resolution. But I think there's a, a breakpoint approaching where you can actually infer gene expression to a much higher degree where you actually could use the low resolution uh, arrays, but infer gene expression in other spaces. So you actually are, are using um, data-driven approaches also for the resolution uh, purpose. So I, I think we're, we're somewhere here improving technology, but also looking at the data-driven uh, alternatives. Uh, Alistair, it looks like that you've identified loss of function tumor suppressors, uh, P10 and CMIC, in your analysis. Uh, would you anticipate that spatial transcriptomics could also identify any gain of function uh, of oncogenic changes? Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks for the question. Um, so I, I certainly agree with that for P10. Um, I'm not sure we'd call CMIC a tumor suppressor. I mean, that, that is a, an oncodriver itself. Um, uh, although its role is complex, and I wouldn't say we've ever fully defined uh, the, the role of CMIC in, in, in cancer, although you know, there are MIC high um, and MIC moderate and MIC low models, uh, transgenic models of prostate cancer. Um, so I think we're seeing both. 
We haven't yet. I mean, we recognize that the gene level elements of this study are hypothesis generating and clearly interrogating at greater resolution specific genes within those areas of gain and loss across the uh, inferred uh, copy number genome will be very interesting, particularly, of course, those copy number events which seem to be present early on and distinguish transformative clones from those which are benign. Uh, so our next question uh, is about uh, epigenetic events uh, linked to the development and progression of prostate cancer. Um, the uh, the audience member notes that it's exciting that you noted a CNV in a benign region, but uh, they wonder, is it perhaps uh, finding CNV in a benign area, could that be expected, especially when we consider that prostate cancer can be a multifocal with independent foci developing at different times in the same prostate gland? Shall I take that as well, Joachim? Please yes. do. Oh, I'm sorry, please. Um, so I'd love to talk to the, this, the person writing this question um, as to whether they truly believe that we have evidence of um, widespread copy number variation, somatic copy number variation in areas of, of benign histology. Um, I'm not, I, we don't think that that has been shown, but I'd love to speak to you if it has, um, if you think it has. Um, so th if you look at the diagrams they published in the sort of many systematic reviews that have been published of, you know, the role of P10, MYC, P53, um, uh, of course, the androgen receptor, um, ETS fusions, NKX 3.1, these typical genes in the TCGA, ICGC papers, which describe uh, mutational events in prostate cancer, they're, they're all describing from transformed histology onwards. I, I have never seen those being shown to be present very early on in the disease or not even in the disease, in, in benign epithelia. But yes, of course, you're absolutely right. We, we, we know prostate cancer is multifocal. Um, we know when we cut out a prostate cancer where we perhaps only found one um, gleason grade of cancer at biopsy, we, we cut out the whole prostate and find many more. Some because they've been missed by the biopsy, others um, because they're just small. And or that might be why they've been missed or because they're in a different part of the gland that's not easy to access. Um, so clearly sampling is important, hence the emphasis on I believe on the importance of MRI targeting, um, but also potentially if our findings are to be believed, finding not just cancer at biopsy, but potentially transformed copy number, trans sorry, uh, uh, genotypically altered, but phenotypically normal areas of benign tissue. Um, and Alistair, uh, depending on whether the tumors that you spoke about were pre-metastatic, could the ICNVs that you spoke about and the transcriptomic changes, uh, could those be used in the future to develop, uh, for example, liquid biopsy assays to detect metastasis? Uh, of course. So I, I, we haven't described it in this talk, but as you've gathered, my strategy is to uh, triangulate these findings with micrometastatic disease, uh, circulating tumor cells being an obvious um, strategic emphasis there, but there are others. Um, and once we, uh, and in prostate cancer, a clone leaving the prostate is a demonstrably powerful surrogate for lethal outcome. Um, uh, so triangulating those findings back to early sampling um, and which is which is my real interest, but in parallel to that, of course, um, if we can use those uh, events which we believe describe lethal disease, um, we can use them not just as as, as fingerprints, but also as, as as treatment targets. Yes. Um, 
Yoi Kim, a question for you. Uh, you mentioned the use of FFPE tissues to perform spatial transcriptomics. Mm. Uh, did you extract identical data uh, in fresh fr from fresh frozen tissues? Um, uh, and if not, do you have uh, do you have an idea of the comparability in terms of uh, sensitivity? Yeah. So um, there are several efforts on the FFP, but in general, you indeed can obtain uh, good transcriptional data from FFP uh, samples. Um, and in our work, we, we demonstrate that we could actually generate not only the gene expression patterns, but we could also infer copy number variations based on, on the FFP protocol we have. So indeed, it's sufficient to do gene expression analysis, and it's also sufficient for infer CMV analysis. And I think that's super, super exciting, given the archival samples that is uh, stored in our, our, in our archives. And can you talk a bit about your preferred method for mRNA extraction from FFPE samples? Um, and as a follow-up on that, what quality of RNA have you been able to extract, and have you been able to perform single-cell isoform analysis? Mm -hmm. Uh, so the isoform analysis requires uh, fresh frozen samples as you, you need to have an intact mRNA population. Um, so that's another, you, you cannot combine that with the formula fixed samples. Um, for the requirements to do a formula in assay, I, I would like to refer to the paper that is coming out in, in cell genomics, but there are also a bioarchive paper where we kind of interrogate different terrene values and the success for different terrene values in terms of and DB200 uh, values for different samples. Um, so there are some thresholds where the data becomes too poor, really. Great. Uh, Alistair, um, back to a question about uh, diagnostics uh, and the, the applicability of your research to diagnostics. What do you think about, um, what would be required, sorry, for, as the next steps towards uh, actually uh, developing a diagnostic uh, in terms of your research on P10? Yes, and I realize I, as I finished speaking, I didn't really quite answer the question about liquid biopsies either, did I? But um, have to come back to that. Um, yeah, that's a difficult question. I, I am not a, um, an oncologist, I'm a surgeon. Um, and so, and my expertise is in, you know, genomic biology uh, scientifically and diagnostics and treatment surgically of prostate cancer rather than developing drugs. And um, if, if that's what the question meant, targeting P10 in that sense. Did you get the sense from that question that it was about uh, P10 as a as a as an oncological target, or as a um, sort of diagnostic, um, I don't know, CT DNA type target. You, you probably don't know the answer to that question. I, I'm not aware. Uh, of it. Yes, I I don't. But uh, feel free to answer the question either way if you're comfortable with it. <laughs> either way. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, I I haven't. Uh, I, I have colleagues who've done a lot of work in the in the circulating tumor DNA space and, and liquid biopsies in that sense. Uh, I'm perhaps more interested in um, circulating tumor cells for the reasons that I've mentioned. Um, I, I am not aware of anybody that has developed a, um, a, a, a very specific or, or any P10 focused uh, liquid biopsy strategy. I'd love to hear from anyone if they have, because there would be clear utility. Um, I think that's probably about all I, I'm going to say on that. All right, fair enough. Um, and then seeing that there are tools to map certain cell types uh, inferred from single cell data, do you think that it would be feasible to skip uh, consensus pathology um, and infer tissue regions just using those tools, um, and then perhaps even do CNV analysis based on those inferred regions? Well, I, I could start and Alistair can continue. I think that's an exciting question and, and prospect. I think we would like to have the pathologies on board for quite some time before we could rely on, on the cell type. And I say that for a reason. Um, in, in, in some other work that's being published now um, in Nature Genetics on uh, breast cancer, we could definitely see there's a, a great value when you have single cell data and you could infer uh, the single cell data from the same patient uh, to the same spatial map of the same patient. So. I think we will still need uh, the pathologist to tell what we have. 
uh, and in the future when these tools are even becoming even more accessible, I think you will do a patient, do a single cell, uh, inf and annotate that single cell clusters, and then you could infer those cell types onto the spatial map from the same patient. And I think the patient-to-patient uh, -patient variation is actually something that people has neglected uh, for quite some time. Alistair, yeah, I, I totally, yeah. thanks. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. We're certainly not going to be saying goodbye to the pathology. Indeed, as I, I think I've been at pains to point out uh, through our, uh, our, 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 our seminar that, that actually you know, we are, um, we stand on the shoulders of giants with pathology in terms of it being pathology that has been really to date the only you know, categorically reliable stratifier of, of, of uh, disease outcome um, in virtually all cancers, not just prostate cancer. Um, but also in this project, we stand on their shoulders in terms of um, you know, all, the, all our findings. Um, I agree with you, Joachim. I think it's going to be um, supplementing and refining an already very good system um, in those areas of where we lack the, the specificity, as mentioned, and of course, sensitivity as well with you know, where men who expect to do well actually do poorly because of you know, hidden features. Um, I, I wouldn't push to replace pathology. Um, I think what we're doing here is, is, is filling the big gap, the, the unmet need in prostate cancer, which is, uh, which, which, we've, which, which I've described. Um, and Alistair, I believe uh, this question is for you, but you can feel free to jump in as well. Um, in this study, did you study the immune cell response or immune markers in the cancerous and benign regions? Um, and if so, did the data indicate uh, any, um, uh, any way that immunotherapy could be applied to prostate cancer? Thanks. Yeah, it's a great question. And, you know, Joachim mentioned earlier on in our talk about uh, this being in part an atlas study as well as a, a sort of biological study and of course although we've only, ref only referred here to the benign and uh, malignant epithelial cells we have profiled all cells in this prostate uh, be they um, stromal fibroblasts cancer associated fibroblasts for example be they immunological uh, be they nerves fat and we've we provide profiles what we haven't sought you, you've got to focus your um, interrogation in a study, haven't you? But we haven't, and, and so that's data for others, or indeed other members of our labs, um, to work with. A, a question I'd be fascinated in is, um, which I wondered if somebody might ask, is what is the difference between the yellow copy number altered but histologically benign clone and the other clones downstream of that, which corresponded to the red? histologically transformed area. Um, it may be time, um, but it's, I'm sure, also going to be niche, environment, context, cell-cell interactions, immunological crosstalk. Joachim, anything to add? No, I, I think uh, there are so many things in the data uh, that we haven't explored, actually, so we'd be more than willing to to see others work on, on the immune component of this study. All right, wonderful. Um, we have come up on our hour, so I'm going to wrap it up there. Uh, we'd like to thank Alistair Lamb, Joachim Lindeberg, and our sponsor, 10X Genomics. If we didn't have time to get to your question, we will try to follow up with our experts. As a reminder, please look out for the pop-up survey after you log out to provide your feedback. If you missed any part of this webinar or wish to listen to it again, a link to an archived version will be emailed to all attendees. Thank you for joining us for this genome webinar.